F1 teams and drivers use telemetry extensively to hone in their lap times and car setups. A couple of decades back you'd hear legendary tales of how nerd boffin Michael Schumacher would study pages and pages of data in telemetry overnight to work out how exactly to optimise his lap and the car. Nowadays that kind of work is fairly par for the course, though will vary between drivers. Telemetry essentially maps out data traces from a car across a lap, and at first glance can appear a confusing mess of lines and be a little impenetrable. Now there's a million things we can go into here, but I'm going to give this something of a light touch and also focus on some points of interest. I'll link to some deeper articles on this in the description if you're interested in exploring more. But surprise, Raid Shadow Legends sponsored this one. The battle strategy mobile game plays across Android and iPhone. You basically jump right in and start battling away with like a bazillion 500 champions to recruit to your team. I open these blue shards and boom, a knight, but with tusks. Boom, a warrior, but with horns. Boom, a grape, but on fire. Who fit around a vast world beating up people with sharp things, heavy things, magic spells, or just punch people in the face? The choices are up to you. Grind for that XP, build up your silver and artifacts and make yourself unstoppable. Will you be better than me? Obviously yes, but will you be better than someone who's good? Maybe. Try the newly released Artifact Forge where you can craft articles directly or take on the new advanced quest to get even more rewards and recruit the latest champions. Click on the link in the description to get Raid Shadow Legend in. If you're new to the game, claim yourself a huge pile of silver, gems, shards and the champion slasher. Slash slash slash. Your treasure will be waiting for you right here. Click there, click in the description. Thank you, Raid Shadow Legends. So this is the main kind of data you'll often see on a telemetry map. Here we're looking at the Albert Park circuit, home of the Australian Grand Prix. I've mashed a bunch of data together from various sources and years, so again, this is all more of a guideline. Okay, so first things first. The width of the chart maps to the length of the circuit. So we start at zero meters over here and go all the way to 5,303 meters over here. From here we can map in things like sectors and turn numbers to make following the graph lines even easier. So roll call then, we've got speed here in red, RPM here in orange, the gear we're in is here in some kind of aqua colour, the throttle or accelerator pedal sits here in brown, the brake pedal pressure is marked in purple, and the steering wheel angle is this dark blue line here. I'll go into these more in a sec. On the telemetry, each graph line has its own colour matching scale down the side, so you can always look up the absolute values for what's going on. So let's have a look at the run from turn 2 to turn 3, which is essentially a straight, a long acceleration zone out of a slowish corner into a hard braking zone. A curve like this on the speed trace is the shape of an accelerating car. The steeper the line, the harder the acceleration, so coming out of a corner like turn 2, you put your foot down, as seen by the throttle pedal hitting the maximum, and the car accelerates. Quickly at first, then the speed rises more slowly as we see the line shallowing out. We can see the driver flicking through the gears, coming out of the corner in 5th, then 6th, 7th, 8th, each journey through a gear accompanied by the engine revs rising and then dropping at each new gear engagement. Then when we reach the braking zone obviously the speed plummets to beat the 100k turn 3 corner speed. If we look at what the driver's feet are doing we can see in this case their right foot comes off the accelerator pedal and the left foot immediately slams on the brakes. There's basically no overlap and coasting here, this is not necessarily always the case though. While the driver is off the throttle they blip down the gears which barely registers as engaged until they are just about ready to get back on the throttle and accelerate out of the corner. The steering angle line is centred around a zero axis, this is when the steering wheel is perfectly straight. Readouts may vary but in this case if the wheel is to the right of centre the line rises above the centre line and vice versa. If the steering wheel trace is climbing the driver is turning the car more to the right and if the line is falling the driver is rotating the wheel left. So essentially if we follow the wheel through turn 3 here it starts off basically neutral in the dead straight position. Then as we turn right the line rises as the wheel turns and turns to a maximum about 95 degrees then we ease the steering wheel back towards the neutral again. The maximum steering point should roughly be where the apex of the corner is. Ok so now we've got an idea for how the shape of these charts translate to what the car is doing, how is this useful? Well the easiest way to extract some information is to compare your chart to another chart as a baseline, your teammate for example. So what we can do is trace a new line across the whole lap that shows how your lap time compares to your teammate's lap time, a time delta. So if this line is at zero, you're on an identical lap time at this point. If the line is below zero, you're ahead. Above zero, you're behind. So we can see that over the course of the whole lap, 
our lap ends up being about six tenths faster than our teammate. This is good, but there still might be some work to do. If this line is dropping, we're gaining time on our benchmark. But if it's rising, we're losing time. Our teammate is faster. So that might be worth investigating. And if we look, we're losing time through roughly turn six to turn eight. So let's zoom in closer and find out why. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, we're breaking a smidge earlier into six than our teammate, as you can see both on the speed and braking trace. We also coast slightly instead of getting straight on the brake pedal once getting off the throttle. Our teammate carries more speed through turn six and then can carry that extra speed all the way through the acceleration zone towards turn eight, as we can see by their speed line being higher through this part of the track. Another thing you can see here is we've probably realized that we were a bit slow into turn six, so we try and make up for it on the exit. So we slam our foot down on the accelerator a little too hard and a little too early, which induces snap oversteer in the car. We can see that first on the steering trace. This is us fighting the wheel to turn into the slide and get the car under control. We also have to back out of the accelerator a bit while we do so. All of this contributes to the slow exit through seven and all the way down to turn eight. Clearly we get it back though through the rest of the lap. Something else to look for is when we're changing through the gears. Are we changing up too early, too late? Mapping these changes against our teammate or against multiple runs and seeing how that translates to the acceleration curves and lap time deltas will help you hone that in. Now as a team, you're also trying to keep an eye on what's going on to try and hone the car itself in or spot problems as they happen. So as an example, you might track the wheel speed of all four wheels. That's just how quickly they're rotating. And you may think, well, that's obviously just gonna match the car speed, isn't it? The faster the car, the faster the wheels turn, but actually not really. When the driver changes up a gear, for example, you'll often get a bit of wheel spin in the rear wheels. Just a touch, nothing normally to worry about, but something you don't want to get too out of control if you want good traction out of slow corners. And obviously locking up the front wheels becomes immediately obvious by a flattening of the wheel speed trace. And you might be able to spot an inside front wheel under rotating through a corner if it's lifting off the ground as the car rolls. If that's undesired, then you might want to fiddle with the suspension. And speaking of suspension, you can track the forces acting on the suspension dampers as the car rolls and pitches under various forces. So if we mapped all four wheels independently, if the car is at rest, we can say the suspension dampers are at neutral loads, just supporting the weight of the car. As the car accelerates, it pitches backwards, putting its load onto the rear suspension and relieving the front. Similarly, as it brakes, the center of mass moves forward and the front of the car takes more of the load than the back. Going through a corner, the car will roll, moving the forces to the outside of the car. So through a left turn, the right side of the car will lift and go light, while the left side of the car takes the brunt of the rolling forces through the suspension. All of this we can see traced through the telemetry, and when matched with other data like acceleration and time deltas, we might want to check the suspension setting as appropriate for the desired performance. And we could go on and on and on. And there's lots of graphs and charts available through a quick Google search. So if you're interested, have a look through them. See if you can decipher what's happening through just these simple lines plotted on a chart. Mm -hmm.